This is the city, Los Angeles, California. For the three and a half million people who live here, the city is one big shopping center. Retail stores in Los Angeles take in more than $2 million a day. Some products aren't sold so openly. Marijuana is one of them. A bag like this goes for $15. It's called a lid. The finished cigarette is called a joint. It sells on the street from 50 to 75 cents. The seller claims it's heaven. The buyer soon finds out it's hell. It's a closed contract until we find out. Then I go to work. I carry a badge. It was Thursday, September 14th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of narcotics division. The boss is Captain Al Tremblay. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. It looked like Bill was getting ready to open a restaurant. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Narcotics, Gannon. Hold on, please. Lieutenant Hanks, 31. What are you doing? Well, what's it look like? Well, it looks like you're running an inventory for a supermarket. Don't be silly. You're not thinking of going on television with Julia Child. She'd probably be delighted if I would. I don't do this often. Do what? Make this sauce. Sauce? If I put it on the market, I could retire and live off the royalties. I could retire on what you spent for all that stuff. These things aren't terribly expensive, Joe. It's how you put them together, but you wouldn't understand. You're a bachelor. Is that right? One part hot mustard, two parts chili powder, four parts freshly chopped red pepper. Yep, that's the way she goes. Just what is that gourmet's delight that you're throwing together there? For barbecue, Joe, for barbecue. Barbecue sauce. You say it like it came out of a bottle. People have been trying to wangle this recipe out of me for years. Really? There we are. You know, I trust you, Joe. That's nice. You're going to be the only other person outside of me, and that includes my wife, that knows all the ingredients of this sauce. Is that so? Now, see if this doesn't make your mouth water. First, you start off with a good-sized bowl. Yeah, I shouldn't wonder. You chill the bowl. Uh-huh. Now, you don't have to bother to take this down. I'll give you a copy, because I know you won't give it out to anybody if I ask you not to. Oh, not me. Into this chilled bowl, you put one quart of ketchup. You mix that up real good. Mix up what? The ketchup. With what? Joe, you don't know anything about cooking. Will you just listen till I'm all through, okay? All right. Now, after you've got that mixed up good, you add one can red pepper, one can hot mustard, one quart vinegar, one pound chopped red peppers, peeled. Of course. Sure. One small jar oregano, four or five good-sized cloves of fresh garlic. Now, what do you do? You tell me. You mix, Joe. You mix with an electric mixer. Now, as you're stirring all this up, you add five chopped Bermuda onions. Beginning to get to you, huh? <laughs> Those onions are. Is that it? No. Here's the secret part that only I know. Now, this is what gives it that hard-to-tell-what's-in-it effect. And what's that? First time I've ever told a soul. I can't wait. This is why you need a big bowl. Yeah. One quart vanilla ice cream. One quart vanilla ice cream. Learned that from an old chef I once knew. You're sure you don't have your recipes mixed up? You wait till you taste it. You're invited. Where? Out to the house Sunday for the barbecue. Oh, uh, I got a date, Bill. I'm sorry. You sure will be. We're having lamb, and that's what's great about this sauce. Yeah. You put it on lamb, you never know it's lamb. Whitey and Gannon, come in the office. Mr. Porter, this is Sergeant Friday and Officer Gannon. I'd like you to tell them just what you told me. How do you do, Mr. Porter? Mr. Porter? Well, frankly, it's difficult to know where to begin. You read about these things in the newspapers, and somehow or other, you convince yourself they can't happen to you. What's that, sir? Drugs, narcotics, the whole dirty business. How do you associate that with a Phi Beta Kappa key? What do you mean, Mr. Porter? My daughter. She was an honor graduate from college. 
magna cum laude in English literature. And now, well, as I told Captain Tremblay, she practically brags about smoking marijuana. How old is she? 22. Certainly old enough to know better. Yes, sir. Her name's Jean. She and her husband, Paul Shipley, live in the valley. They bought a place in Sherman Oaks last year, 1698 Yolanda. Yes, sir. Frankly, I, I don't know whether coming down here is going to do any good. But I've tried everything else, including threatening her with a lawsuit. Well, how's that, sir? Custody suit. She's got a little girl, two years old, Robin. Only grandchild I have. Maybe the only one I'll ever have. I told Jean if she and her husband continued experimenting with marijuana and whatever else it is these people you read about experiment with, well, I'd, I told her I'd take them to court and take Robin away from them. She laughed at me. Yes, yeah, sir. Maybe you can do some good with her. Lord knows I didn't. She won't even talk to me anymore. It's as if we were in different worlds. I don't understand her, and she doesn't understand me. And my little granddaughter is the innocent one caught in the metal. We'll check into it, see what we can do. Thank you. Strange, isn't it? What's that, sir? Other than to ask directions, this is the first time I've ever talked to a policeman in my life. p.m. We left Mr. Porter with the captain and drove out to the Sherman Oaks address of Gene and Paul Shipley. It was on a quiet street in one of the better neighborhoods in the valley. It took us about 25 minutes to get there, 6.03 p.m. Nice place. Out of the low rent district, that's for sure. Gene Shipley? That's right. Police officers. This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Yes. All right, if we come in. What for? We'd like to talk to you. What about? We'd rather talk to you inside. I guess it's all right. Come in. Now, what is this all about? We have a report you and your husband have been smoking marijuana. Oh, well, take a good look. This is our den of iniquities. Yes, ma'am. You said someone told you I smoke marijuana. Do you? Smoking marijuana is against the law. That's right. Did you know they say Coleridge was a drug addict? And that he wrote Xanadu under the influence of pastiche? It's a beautiful epic poem, don't you think so? In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. I recite it to my little girl Robin sometimes. She likes the sound of the words. Yes, ma'am, but we were talking about marijuana. Like you said, it's against the law. Why? Why is it against the law? Because it's classified as a narcotic. But it's not addictive. It's not even very strong. And you know that for a fact, do you, ma'am? I've tried it a long time ago. Frankly, it's overrated. Our report is right, then. You have used marijuana. Why should I deny it? Frankly, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Marijuana is no more addictive than having a drink before dinner. Just because it's illegal doesn't make it morally wrong. Besides, it's certainly better for you than liquor. You know, we've heard a lot of people claim that marijuana is harmless. Professors, doctors, even some ministers. Now, maybe they know something that we don't. All we have to go on is the record. We know that practically every kid we pick up on LSD has marijuana in his pocket. We know that we arrest more than 14,000 addicts a year. They're on heroin, cocaine, methadrine, pills, you name it, and they're using it. And they all have one thing in common. They began with marijuana. If you're claiming that smoking marijuana automatically makes you a drug addict, I offer myself as proof you're wrong. No, lady, we don't claim that every person who smokes marijuana becomes an addict. But we do know one thing for sure. No addict ever got there in one big step. They had to begin somewhere. And they all began with marijuana. Well, it seems to me there's a very large hole in your logic, Mr. Friday. Is that right? You didn't say anything at all about the type of person that becomes a drug addict. It seems to me that only a neurotic or psychotic would need the crutch offered by drugs. I'm certainly not one of those. Maybe not. And you're probably right as far as you go. Besides the neurotic and the psychotic, there's also the experimenter, the ordinary person with a yen to find out for himself, the intellectual addicts. Well, they do all right until they wake up one morning and find out they're not experimenting anymore, that they're hooked. You wouldn't be the first experimenter lady who ended up spending the rest of her life looking for a fix. It's happened before. It could happen to you. Do you have any narcotics on the premises now? Certainly not. Do you mind if we look around? If I have a choice, I'd rather you didn't. My husband Paul will be home any minute. I don't think he'd like the idea of two policemen rummaging through the house. Pardon me. Robin? How's my baby girl, huh? 
I can tell you quite honestly that if I did permit you to look around, you wouldn't find anything. I suppose we'll have to take your word for that. I do have a choice, then. Yes, ma'am, you do. All right, then. Will you excuse me for a minute? I have to see about dinner. Hi, Eileen. What's for dinner? It's a couple of policemen in the living room, dear. Okay, I'll talk to them. How are you, Robin? How are you today, huh? I'm Paul Shipley. Gene tells me you're a policeman. Yeah, sir. Did she tell you why we're here? Something about somebody telling you we smoke marijuana. Excuse me if I'm a little angry, but then it seems to me I have pretty good reason to be. Her father told you that, didn't he? Just can't keep his big fat nose out of our lives. Look, the way I see it, he had no right to tell you anything about us, and you have no right to be in my house. But since you're here, I might as well make the best of it. Mind if I sit down? It's been one of those days. Where do you work, Mr. Shipley? Spindle Chemical. Programmer. That means I operate a computer. You been there long? Since I got out of the service three years in March. Where are you from? Native Californian, born and raised. Father and mother live here in Los Angeles? Look, if you have a form with you, I'll be pleased to fill it out. Just routine. It's not routine for me. It's not often that I have a policeman in my house ask me a lot of personal questions. As a matter of fact, this is the first time. Never been in trouble before? No, and as far as I can see, I'm in no trouble now. Have you been smoking marijuana? Marijuana is illegal, I know that. That's right. For now. In a couple of years, things may change when all the kids grow up and start wearing ties and going to the polls. Marijuana's gonna be like liquor, packaged and taxed and sold right off the shelf. I doubt it, Mr. Shipley. Look, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it seems to me there must be better things for cops to do than chase down wild rumors about something as innocent as marijuana. Why don't you go after the big bad guys, the heroin peddlers? I won't argue with you about them. They should be stopped. That's right. We'd like to put them out of business. That's why we're here. What do you mean? We're trying to keep them from getting a new customer. There's a big difference between marijuana and hard narcotics. Yeah, but it's only a small step. And everybody who takes a drink is going to be an alcoholic. We know that's not true, don't we? Let's face it, we're on opposite sides of the fence, and there's nothing we can do about it. For you, if there's a law against it, it's wrong, black and white. I just don't see things that way, that's all. Well, you ought to give it a try, fella. It might keep you out of jail. Maybe. But we'll change the law someday, even though your friend here thinks we won't. Believe me, it's a new world. Your laws are as outdated as bustles. Laws are going to have to be changed to keep pace with the new morality. They'll change or we'll have to break them. What about your daughter? How's she going to feel if you end up in jail? She won't like it any more than I will, but you'll have to catch me before you can arrest me, won't you? In the meantime, it's a big game of hide-and-seek, and to me, it is a waste of time. How old are you, Shipley? Twenty-three. Isn't it about time you grew up? Here we go, lecture number 131A. No, I'm not gonna give you a lecture. I don't have the time. I'm just gonna lay it out for you straight. Now, you listen to me. You chippy around with marijuana long enough and you're gonna buy yourself a lot of grief. After a while, marijuana won't be enough. You'll start looking for a bigger kick and then a bigger one after that. And all of this is gonna go down the tubes. Your job, your house, car, family, everything. We've seen it happen before. And not just to the neurotics and psychotics that wife of yours talks about, but to nice, clean-cut kids from good families with good educations. They start out just like you, and they end up mainliners, shooting it in their arms. And they end up dead, or wishing they were. Maybe. Look, everybody says no, not me. I'll never get hooked. They say it right up to the day they start climbing the walls, and they began saying just what you are now. There's nothing wrong with marijuana. Well, there's nothing wrong with a gun either until you pull the trigger. You can't even buy this stuff without getting dirty. Think about the guy you bought it from. You think he has a wife, a nice child, a home? No junkies do. They spend most of their time sicker in jail. Don't you take my word for it. Just take a look at the guy you bought from. And look hard, fella, because you're looking right in the mirror. Now, if that's how you want it, there's nothing we can do about it right now. Next time it may be different. And you believe me, boy, there'll be a next time. <laughs> Dinner's ready. Good. Is school off for the day? Will you be seeing my father after you leave? Should we? No, but if you do, will you tell him something for me? Sure. Ask him to read the Bible. The epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. Maybe you'll understand. How's that? Because of what it says about our generation. Tell him to read chapter 6. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. The old ways are not their ways. Your dusk is their dawn. The future is theirs. Try chapter 5, lady. The apostle Paul also said this. Yes, what is that? See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise.
6.32 p.m., we returned to the office and filled in the captain. Without additional information or admissible evidence, there was little we could do about the Shipleys or their daughter, Robin. On the way up to the third floor, we shared the elevator with policewoman Dorothy Miller from Juvenile Division. We told her about the Shipley woman. Well, if you could arrest them for additive, you'd probably have a good case. Yeah, something you might want to check out. What's that? Little girl named Robin, about two years old, pretty good. Was she hurt or neglected? No, not yet, anyway. What do you mean, not yet? It's pretty easy to figure, Dorothy. What happens when both her parents get really turned on? Two-year-old kid. Well, you might be able to make an endangering case, I doubt it. From the way you tell it, it sounds like a nice home, clean and neat. I don't think there's enough to go on. Be worth checking, wouldn't it? I don't think there's much I could do, Joe. You couldn't arrest them for attitude, and I can't arrest them for something they might do. We'll have to wait until something happens. Yeah, I guess so. Give me probable cause, and I'll move on it, Joe. Otherwise, there's nothing I can do. Well, you could go out and talk to her, couldn't you? What am I going to tell her that you didn't? This little girl, you said she's not hungry, dirty, abused? Not yet. Let me show you something. Something that's happening right now, not maybe tomorrow sometime. It's a case I'm working now. Take a look at these. That house is 15 minutes from Beverly Hills. The father works out in the valley, a gardener. That's his youngest son. His name's Rick. His father did that to him. Looks like he used him for a punching bag. Four years old. The mother's over at Central Juvenile. She told us her husband beat the boy with a garden shovel. Yeah. Nice people. And do you know what tears it? By the time I get back to my office, she'll change her story. Claim the boy fell down and had an accident. How do you figure that? She's scared. She's 36, unskilled, and she's not as pretty as she used to be. If she doesn't change her story, her husband's going to stay in jail. Then who's going to buy the groceries? And that's happening right now. We get at least one a week. We've got 85 kids in McLaren Hall out in El Monte. The county's taking care of another 25, all hurt, hungry, and bleeding. I've headed up to here with heartbreak. You've seen one little girl who may get hurt. I've seen hundreds who have. We don't have the laws to do anything about the future, Joe. We've got our hands full with the present. Now I've got to go. I'll be in my office in about 20 minutes. Shoot me over a copy of your report. As soon as I get some time, I'll go out and talk to your nice lady. Thanks, Dorothy. You think it'd make an impression on her if I cried? Probably right, but we can't bust them for the way they think. All up a little girl, the granddaughter. She's not hurt or hungry. Better call Porter, let him know the girl's all right. Yes, yeah, sir. Rode up in the elevator with Dorothy Miller, juvenile division. She's gonna check it out, possible endangering. Think it'll stick? No, sir, but even if it doesn't, it might do some good. How do you figure? We'll let them know we're thinking about them. For the next two months, Bill and I didn't have much time to check back on the Shipleys. Dorothy Miller from Juvenile Division conducted her own investigation and she didn't come up with much more than we had. Until something happened, there was nothing we could do. Bill and I were assigned another case, the surveillance of a major Los Angeles narcotics supplier. On Thursday, November 12th, we arrested him, 10.30 p.m. Well, this one was worth the sweat. Yeah, it was a good bust. 12 ounces of pure heroin, worth about a quarter of a million on the street, $3,600 wholesale. The captain coming down? Yeah, the lieutenant called him. Fruit of the poppy. You wouldn't think a simple flower could cause so much grief. This tin button. You suppose this is what they're trying to tell us? Man, will you call it? You're not dealing with a common criminal. You want those cuffs back on, buddy? You my shirt, man. Just sit down there and be quiet. You guys need a hand? Yeah. Where'd you find him? On Ventura Boulevard. Had these in his pocket. A roach and two joints. Man, I wasn't bothering nobody. Why are you guys always pushing me around? Joe, you want to hand me the 510 pad? There you go. What's your name, fella? Freddy, man. Freddy the Loader. That's your last name, is it? Loader? <laughs> no, man. Fred Ludden. They just call me that. Who calls you that? Everybody. What have you been up to, Freddy? Nothing, man. I was just drinking a little wine, that's all. These two came along and gave me a hard time, that's all. Where'd you score the joints? Wine, man, that's all. Just a little juice of the wild grape. Two aliases, Lawrence and Franklin. Four arrests, one conviction on probation. Got a job, Freddy? I ain't got the time. Where'd you get the bread to score? Don't need money, man. That's love grass. What do you mean by that? No bread. Free score. Some chick gave it to me. Yeah, sure. In the valley, man. Release square. Where in the valley? 
Sherman Oaks, a place on Yolanda. There's a weed party going on there right now, man. Really wild. Any names? Uh, a chick named Shipley gave me the grass. That's all I know. That's enough. <laughs> At 2 p.m., on the way to the Sherman Oaks address, we asked that a radio unit cover the back entrance of the house. It was 11.43 p.m. when we got to the Shipley residence. All right. All right, police officers, everybody just stay put. You're under arrest. Howard, George. I'll check the kitchen. I know you. Nobody invited you. You're not welcome in my house anymore. Found this and trying to slide out the back door. How did you know we were having a party tonight? First time we ever did on a Thursday. Yeah, we usually turn on Friday night. This lid was on the drain board. Did my father faint on us again? Where's your daughter? I don't know. She was with Jane. Baby belongs with its mother. Don't you people know where your baby is? Jane. Where's Robin? Where's little Robbie? Robbie. Robbie. Where's little Robbie? Robin! just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 14th, trial was held in Department 180, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Due to the death of their daughter, Paul Shipley was found guilty on a charge of involuntary manslaughter. He was placed on probation. Jean Shipley did not stand trial. As a result of the tragedy, she was placed under the supervision of the State Department of Mental Hygiene.